Um, we're going to, first of all, we're going to look at Joshua chapter 24. So let's first simply read the chapter like we normally do. And then, um, as we're reading the chapter, if you would, be cognizant, be aware of sort of what occurs to you, what you see, what uh, you notice, because of two things. Number one, we may talk about those things. Number two, um, that is God working in you as you read his word to call attention, your attention, to things he wants you to, to look at. So I would encourage you to pay attention to God working in you like that. Um, so, Joshua chapter 24. I'll go... Uh, might be better if I didn't read. I'm happy to read, but it's the King James. So, you guys, that might kind of... So, maybe, would someone else be willing to read Joshua chapter 24? Or a couple of people? So. Okay, why don't you go ahead and read maybe the first... Uh, uh, first read the first ten verses. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Then Joshua summoned all the people of Israel to share, along with their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. Joshua said to the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the hill country of Seir, while Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt. And afterward, I brought you out as a free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after you with chariots and horses. When you cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. With your very own eyes, you saw what I did. Then you lived in the wilderness for many years. Finally, I brought you into the land of the Amorites on the east side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Then Balak, son of Zephor, king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He asked Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you. Anybody else want to? Carson, you go ahead. You went over to Jordan and came to Jericho, and to them Jericho called against you. Also the Amorites, the Desirites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gershites. Gershites? Gershites? Gershites, Hittites, and the Hittites. But I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet uh, before you who drove.
Thank you, Carson. Um, somebody want to read? Go ahead. Just read. I think you can. Well, just go ahead through the end. It's 33, so just go ahead through the end. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Huh. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. After these things, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath Serah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt. They buried them at Shechem, in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance to descendants of Joseph. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of Phinehas, his son, which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for everybody reading. Um, so... Briefly, anything you noticed, anything came to mind or struck your heart as you read the chapter, just things of interest? We may or may not talk about them, but, you know, thumbnail sketch, anything hit your mind? It's okay if it didn't, or that you don't want to say it, that's okay, I just want to give you the chance. Just to say that they, at that time, the people seemed pretty well united in determining that they were. It's a good. It's a good point. We'll look further at that. It's, that's a good point. And whether they did or not, there, you know, that we'll look at that as well. But that's a good point. Anybody else? Yeah. Seems like Joshua shares and recounts the Lord's faithfulness in His dealings with Israel mm -hmm. before He issues a personal charge, mm -hmm. saying, "Look at God's track record of faithfulness." Count him faithful, turn from your idols, choose to serve him. Great point. That's a great point. We'll look at another instance in the New Testament where God, by way of Paul's revelation, does the same thing with us um, in the New Testament. That the logical thing to do in light of God's faithfulness and track record is to obey. And, and we'll look at that, but that's a great point. Anybody else? Okie dokie. Um, I want to give you just a brief overview of Joshua since Joshua 24, Joshua 23 and 24, are Joshua, that is the person Joshua, sort of his swan song, so to speak. I mean, this is going to be his final charge to the children of Israel. Joshua 23 that uh, Jim Rouse taught the last couple of weeks actually occurs like a number of years before Joshua 24 does. Joshua's, um, it's, it's one chronology they looked at, separated them by about eight years or so. In any case, as we read in this record, Joshua is going to be, he's going to die. You know, this is his, the last um, charge to the children of Israel. And Joshua is not, not, I'm not suggesting Joshua is doing this of his own accord. He is acting on God's command and inspiration just like he did his whole life from the first time we see him in Exodus 17 when he fights the Amalekites. He's always acting on God's current uh, command. In any case, um, he is 110 years old, and he's about to breathe his last. This is his sort of final message. Analogous in the New Testament, 2 Timothy, last thing Paul says to Timothy. Those four chapters are the last thing Timothy ever heard from Paul. It was, his, it was the final revelation you know, in, in Jesus Christ's life. John 17. Last things, it's seven, yeah, 17, last things he ever said to the disciples before he was 
um, condemned to death and crucified. Okay? So these are particularly important words. Uh, that's some of what we're talking about here. So just by way of overview, the book of Joshua covers the time from Moses' death to Joshua's death, about 17 years. Um, and we'll probably not deal with this tonight, I don't think, um, but we'll deal, with, we'll deal with it probably next week when we talk more about uh, legacy, you know, what, what a man's legacy is both from the man's perspective as well as God's perspective. But this is part of Joshua's legacy. This is part of what we're reading about here. Um, and imagine you were addressing your family or extended family with the last thing you were going to tell them and what gravity those words would have, because that's what this is. Except it's also God inspiring him to say what he said. Um, the sections of the book, we looked at chapters 1 through 12, which were the conquest of the land, like five to seven years. They're fighting like crazy. We learned that, yes, God gave them a gift, but it doesn't mean they don't fight for it. It doesn't mean they're just going to walk in and, here's an open door, you can have all that stuff, everybody's going to leave of their own accord. That didn't happen. They had to fight tooth and nail for this. They had to shed blood for this. Joshua was a man of war. We see that from the first time we see him in Scripture. And he was the one that was going to divide the land. God told him that in chapter 1. You divide the land. So five to seven years that took place. Chapters 13 through 22 is the dividing up of the land. One of the things we saw in there was the, the uh, children of Israel were reluctant to take possession. We saw that in Joshua 18.3. He says, why are you taking so long? What's, Joshua's telling him this. Why are you taking so long to do this? God gave you this land. What's the problem? We'll look at that a little later. And then 23 and 24, we're looking at jo Joshua's closing addresses. Um, I wanted to mention one thing about, I think Tom actually mentioned this in one of his teachings, but I wanted to mention it because it's a great lesson. Um, this is a map. Well, let me show you the scripture reference. Um, you may remember that the promised land as a land, as a gift, was promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, right? So that's um, about 500 years before what we read about in the book of Joshua, everything we've read about with the promised land. About 500 years before that is when it was actually promised. Then they get to, so in Genesis 15, God is a little more specific. In 12, he doesn't say what the boundaries are going to be. He doesn't say how big this gift is going to be. But in 15, he does. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Under the, thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, the Nile, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay? So those were the original borders. That is the map of the promised land as God promised it in Genesis 15 to Abraham. Okay? There's one other place, Exodus 23, where he reiterates this. He says, and I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea. It's over, well, depending on what you, there's a little controversy over the Red Sea. But generally speaking, it's right in here. So it's right near the River Nile. Okay? Unto the Sea of the Philistines, which is the Mediterranean. And from the desert, unto the desert, unto the river. The river, when you see the river in Scripture, it's usually the River Euphrates. So again, he reiterates those borders. That's how big the Promised Land was going to be. This is what I want to give you. So what they actually did, though, so with the promised land, what they actually did was, and, and I mentioned Joshua 18.3, Joshua said unto the children of Israel, how long are you slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? This is a mini-map, same map we just looked at, but smaller scale. So that was the original promised land. And modern day, this is like Egypt, you know, Iran, Iraq. I mean, this is a huge area of land, right? So... That's the map of it, but look what they actually did. What they actually, the promised land as we saw it settled, this is where the tribes actually, their allotment was as it is on that map. It was only that little spot right there relative to what God actually promised. Okay? Very small part. Yeah, really. Yeah, really. Um, in any case, look at what God promised look at what God's desire was for them, and look at what they were willing to settle for. So, just, I, we didn't, I mean, this isn't specifically in Joshua, but Joshua deals kind of thematically with the children of Israel's disobedience. And we're talking about centuries of disobedience. And we'll see that in the narrative. 
We're talking about centuries of disobedience. But they were also unwilling to really walk into God's promise. Okay? They were unwilling to do that. Um, and life lesson, we should strive to realize the full potential of what God promises in our lives. Don't settle. Try not to settle for less. Try to really strive for what God promises, whether that's a great marriage, a great family, godly kids, your rights in Christ as a son of God, your uh, sharpening your abilities as whatever it is you're gifted to do. Don't settle. Don't settle. Imagine if Joshua had settled. I mean, who else was going to do this, for heaven's sake? Nobody else wanted to do it. He had to reprimand him repeatedly for not wanting to do it. So, supposing Joshua says, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to wash my hands of this, I'm out of here. But he had to just keep going. He didn't quit. To the day he died, he didn't quit. 110 years old, breathing his last, choose you now. That's Joshua. So, we need to not settle. Um, but that's sort of a sidelight. There isn't a specific verse in Joshua that deals with that, but I wanted to mention it. So we do read in this narrative, and I'll, I'll ask you a couple questions that hopefully you'll, it'll jog your memory a bit, but we read in the first verse, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Now, um, does anybody remember the first city, uh, whatever, encampment, that the children of Israel came into when they crossed the River Jordan from west to east. They crossed the River Jordan, you know, west to east, do you remember? Okay, so it was, Gil, it was Gilgal. All right, you remember, remember Gilgal. Gilgal is named, it means roll off. That's what the word means, okay? And you may remember from Joshua chapter 5 how he said, okay, you're going to circumcise everybody that was in the wilderness. So they got these hills of foreskins. Let's not be too graphic, shall we? Okay, but in Joshua 5, when the covenant is re administered, if, if you want to call it that. God says, today I have rolled off the reproach of Egypt. And he called, and, and the name of their place was called Gilgal because it was that rolling off, because that's where that took place. So Gilgal was the first place. And then you may remember from Joshua 18 when Joshua moved from Gilgal to Shiloh, right? And he takes, he sets up the tabernacle and he takes the Ark of the Covenant there and that's the central location. So we got Gilgal first, and then they changed to Shiloh. After that, it doesn't change anymore, except here. But he doesn't gather in Shiloh. He gathers in Shechem. Now, why is that? So if you look at Shechem, biblically, well, you know, the Gilgal thing I just covered, and Gilgal again, and then he moves to Shiloh, we mentioned in John 18, or Joshua 18, and then it goes to Shechem, Let's look at a little bit of the history of Shechem. Shechem was actually where Abraham got the first promise for the promised land. Okay? Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the place of Mori, and the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. So Shechem was the place of the first promise. Number one. Number two. In Genesis 35... Well, we're going to go ahead and read this just because it's important, and this is a recurring theme in Joshua 24. This is critically important for what the children of Israel didn't realize in God's promise. It's critically important that we, and it's all over the place, but it's just critical that we understand it. So, Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Wait a minute. Put away the strange gods? So, we've got idol worship, that was cleansed at Shechem, Jacob, right, one of the patriarchs, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Israel. He's the father of this. He says, put away the strange gods. He does that at Shechem. Now, that's about not quite 500 years, 400 years, 350 to 400 years before Joshua 24 takes place. Right? So, back this far, Jacob is cleansing his household of idolatry. Right? That took place at Shechem. The original promise for the promised land, that took place at Shechem. So Joshua has the children of Israel gather at Shechem because of what the history that it has. Look what happened here. The original promise was here. The cleansing of idolatry, which is exactly what Joshua is going to do here. Jacob did it 400 years before from his household. Joshua is going to do it from the whole nation in Joshua 24. He's doing the same thing. 
So sad that after four centuries, he's doing the same thing on a national level, not just a family. Okay, so that happened at Shechem. So that was why Shechem. Um, I thought of this, I, I thought of um, the fact that Joshua had this done at Shechem because of its rich history. I thought of traditions. And I, particularly, I thought of this verse, actually, partly because, well, let's read the verse. It's 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, the reason I thought of this is this. I'll give you a little bit of background. When Marguerite and I had a chance to share at the retreat, we chose to share about the Thessalonians as a model church, as a church that responded with believing to God's word and look at what an unbelievable church they were. One of the things you have to remember or understand about the Thessalonians is that um, Paul goes to Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, right, during the, his second missionary journey. Um, none of the books, let me repeat that, none of the books of the New Testament were written at that time. There was no Bible. There were Hebrew texts, you know, Hebrew Old Testament. But 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians were the first two books of the New Testament written. They were written a little after he was there when he was in Corinth for a year and a half. He wrote those two epistles back to them. But they were the only New Testament books written. There were no other books. Which is why Paul has to say here, stand fast, hold the traditions, which you've been taught either whether by word, when we actually told you when we were there, or when we wrote you about them, because there were no other sources. Now, the thing I thought of with that, though, is, um, again, I go, I, it keeps occurring to me the importance of men as husbands and fathers, because either as husbands or fathers, many times, <laughs> and this is sort of sad, because a lot of times we as men don't even get to this point. However, many times the people around you are not going to read the Bible. You know, they're not going to read the Bible. They're not going to memorize the scripture. They're not going to be Bible teachers. They're not going to be Bible students. They're not going to do that. They're going to read you. They're going to see, is Christianity making any difference in your life? Is there any change in the way you act or speak? And that's part of the traditions. When you're a father, for example, your kids don't get to the point of reading the Bible for a good, understandably, for a good solid 10 years. And if you wait that long to expose them to godliness, you're in big trouble. That's why our example is the first thing they read. They read the gospel according to us before they ever read the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Right? Those are traditions. That's an example of traditions. Because I don't know about you guys. Um, you know, my parents were wonderful parents. They were fabulous parents. So maybe like you, your mom or dad, you might... They might have habitually said something that you remember. I don't know. My mom, my dad was pretty quiet. He didn't talk a lot. I mean, he was, he was a wonderful man, but he, he didn't talk a lot. Um, but my mom, one of the things she would say, she died in 2014. She was at 89 years old. So the, but the things that I remember her saying date back to my teen years. Okay, so that's 45 years ago, right? But they're still in my head. One of the things that she used to say is, Steve, there's going to be a lot of things in life you don't like. I still remember that. That's part of her legacy. That's part of the tradition she handed down to me. I remember that. After 45 years, I remember that. After she's dead, I remember that. So your kids, maybe your wife, possibly, they're going to read the gospel according to you. What traditions do you pass down in the way that you act? What traditions do you pass down in how you react to an emergency situation? How do you do that? And therefore... How am I going to do that? Because of how you did that. There's a great poem I heard a long time ago, a Bible teacher that I used to listen to, golly, 30, 40 years ago, used this poem. And I'd like to just read it with you. It's a great poem. The Gospel According to You. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are read by more than a few. But the one that is most read and commented on is the Gospel According to You. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the things that you do and the words that you say. Men, read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? Do men read his truth and his love in your life? 
Or has yours been too full of malice and strife? Does your life speak of evil, or does it ring true? Say, what is the gospel according to you? Most people don't ever get to the point of reading the Bible. Even Christians, they frankly don't. But they'll read you. So that's part of the traditions that you know, Joshua meant, go, takes them to Shechem because of that rich tradition. When Paul, in, uh, to the Thessalonians, when there wasn't any Bible to, you know, he couldn't say, go to Romans chapter 12. You're supposed to be transformed by the... That wasn't written yet. There was no record of Jesus' life yet. He couldn't do that. It wasn't there. But he could say, remember the traditions that I told you or that I wrote you about. Yeah, yeah. Correct. He had Hebrew scripture. Well, actually, that's a great point. That is a great point. Well, no, that's a great point because when we read Joshua, we don't think, I, I think, I think people don't think there was a written word of God. But the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Fiction, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those were written because in Joshua 1, um, if you want to take your Bible and turn to Joshua 1, I don't have anything on the screen with it, but... That's a great point, and I wanted to bring that up, so I'm glad you did. Um, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart. So that means there was a book. And that means he was expected to know it. Right? That's a great point, because at that point, even at that point, there was a Torah. There was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The other events hadn't taken place yet, for heaven's sake. But there was the law, and Joshua had that law, and he was commanded by Moses to know that law. And he was actually, Moses was commanded by God, you make sure you write this stuff down and you give it to Joshua. You make sure you get that done. So anyway, great point. Um, Joshua chapter 24, again. So anyway, uh, let's go. So I thought of traditions. I thought of the, again, the, again it keeps uh, occurring to me or reoccurring to me the importance of men as leaders in the church, we'll, talk, we'll look at that as well, as husbands and leaders of their wives, as fathers and leaders of their families. Um, it's just critically important. It's a huge privilege, honor, and responsibility that God has decided it's okay for men to have. He's, as we've talked about, I know I talked about it before in one of the chapters I taught, God has chosen to need men. You know, he told Joshua, the land. He told Moses, you go in and free the people. He could have done it alone, for heaven's sake. He didn't need Moses. He didn't need Joshua. He could have done it alone. He chose to need them. So he needs you. He needs us. Because he's chosen to need us. And hopefully we're going to respond to that. Uh, so, now, I want to mention this in the, in the context of traditions, and I don't want to um, complicate, overcomplicate things. I actually talked about this topic of epigenetics in Joshua chapter 1 when I talked about the power of words when Joshua 1 says uh, to, that, that Joshua, God tells Joshua that you're supposed to meditate in the law day and night. And the power of words and that meditation and what it, believe it or not, what it actually does to your DNA, <laughs> believe it or not. Okay, so to give you a thumbnail sketch, every human being has 46 chromosomes, right? They're made up of DNA. It's, it's, it's a DNA molecule. DNA molecule has 3,000, I'm sorry, 3 billion, count them, 3 billion base chains that are all in a row, right? That is, the, that's the definition of how we get to be how we are. That's, it's based on the DNA we have. So epigenetics is the concept of factors which influence the expression of genes, how a particular gene, uh, a map, if you will, of, of what you're going to look like or how you're going to be. It's, it's factors that affect that gene expression and are inheritable, but are not actually part of the chemical part of the molecule. In other words, it's sort of like an on and off switch. Now, and let, uh, let me get to the point before you. So, epigenetic modifications are chemical tags which alter how a gene is expressed. It turns it either off or on. We'll get to this, uh, why this is important too. 
And then epigenetic inheritance means that a parent's experiences the choices they make, what they choose to do, in the form of epigenetic tags, can be passed down to future generations. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up all is not to bring up some highfalutin word or highfalutin concept. It is simply the fact that, you know how in the um, Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, God says, you know, don't do this, do that. He says, and then he says, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation but unto thousands of, the Hebrew text, based on my understanding, is actually means thousand generations. In other words, his grace extends far beyond any punishment, far, far beyond. But in any case, do you see how good or evil is, is transgenerational? You don't only suffer the, the responsibility for your bad choices. Your children may as well because of this. Because how their DNA is actually expressed, how they actually turn out, to some degree, can be based on your poor choices or good choices. That's why I'm bringing this up. Because again, the hugely important role that the family plays in the transmission of, spiritual, of, of Christian spirituality from one generation to the next, it's just tremendously important. And it can be something as simple as, you know, if you sit down and read the Bible routinely, your kids are going to see that. If you sit down and pray routinely, your kids are going to see that. If a problem comes up and your child knows about it, just, Dad, what are we going to do? Son, all we're going to do is pray about it. God will take care of this. He's going to hear that. Those little tags that are on and off switches for genes are turned on and off appropriately in a godly way. And it's passed down from generation to generation. Alternatively, let me give you the alternative. Here are examples of epigenetics. Okay, so addiction. Everybody knows about addiction. Everybody's talking about the opioid epidemic. Okay, so my wife is, I think I've mentioned, she's a social worker. She specializes in dealing with people who have addictions, either to alcohol, most of the time to narcotics. These people that she deals with are also what is normally referred to as profoundly mentally ill. Okay, so they have an opioid addiction, and, and I'm not being disrespectful, they have an opioid addiction, and they're crazy. Both. Okay, now, so we're chatting. We, as we went to Florida over the weekend, a lot of driving time, so we're chatting about this and that. Joshua 24, a book we read by A.W. Tozer, this and that and the other thing. So she mentions, while we were driving home last night, she said, yeah, you know, she said one of the big deals in hospitals nowadays, she said, is uh, they've got to make a pathway, which what she's referring to is a treatment pathway, for employees who are addicted to opioids because they have diverted patients' medications to themselves. Even injections. They'll fill the syringe that's for Denny with physiologic saline, so he gets something that's not going to hurt him, and it looks like he gets an injection, and they take the morphine. Okay? So the opioid epidemic is, where, well, another thing that she mentioned, which again I'll just mention, is um, it was in some kind of a uh, treatment meeting she was in at work, and she said to the people around her, she said, um, you know, you guys don't understand. She said, we're at least three generations deep in this opioid epidemic because I'm dealing with the children of addicts, the addicts, and the addicts, the, their essentially grandparents that are on methadone to control their addiction. So we're at least three generations deep. We're three generations gone in this opioid epidemic. And even if we start right now and everything goes well, it's going to be two generations before we can deal with it. It's because of this phenomenon. It's because of epigenetics. Because it's transgenerational. When they make, when mom and dad make poor choices, the kids make poor choices. They're much more like because of this. Now, the flip side of this is obviously when you make good choices, the kids make good choices. And that's the way spirituality is appropriately passed from generation to generation. But so is bad. So is evil. So anyway, let's read this. Addiction is a disorder of the brain's reward system which arises through neuroepigenetic mechanisms and occurs over time 
from chronically high levels of exposure to an addictive stimulus, such as morphine, cocaine, sex, gambling. You know, if you get this all the time, if you have sex all the time, you begin to crave it. You have an addictive behavior. Gambling, same way. Alcohol, same way. Okay? Transgenerational, across generations, mom to kids to grandkids. Okay? Transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of addictive behaviors has been noted to occur in preclinical studies. So when mom and dad are addicts, the kids are addicts. It's transgenerational. That's the power, the, the, the positive power and negative, I guess, the positive power of what a mom and a dad can do in a family. They make good choices. Godliness lives on to the next generation. They make bad choices. Guess what? That works too. Um, let's cover one more thing and then we'll stand up for a break. This is another epigenetic thing. thing. This is fear conditioning, okay? Being afraid of something. I thought this was a great example of epigenetics. We're just going to read this now, okay? Studies on mice have shown that certain conditional fears can be inherited from either parent. In one example, mice were conditioned to fear a strong scent, acetophenone, by accompanying the smell with an electric shock. So, they, 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 they got these mice. They put this acetophenone stuff in so that the mice can smell it. At the same time, they poke them with an electric shock, right? So they associate the smell with the electric shock, right? They're associating those things. So the way they react to the electric shock eventually is the way they're going to react to the smell. So they, they get physical pain when they smell it, so what happens is they start to fear the smell. Okay, that's what they're doing. So they do this with a group of mice, right? Now, let's read on. It was discovered that this fear could be passed down to the mice offspring, despite the offspring never experiencing the electric shock. Themselves, the mice still display a fear of the scent because they inherited the fear epigenetically, okay? So even though the next generation of mice never got the shock, they still are afraid of the smell because they inherited that. And this is the kicker. These epigenetic changes lasted up to two generations without reintroducing the shock. So mom and dad get the smell and the shock, and they're afraid of the smell because of it. But the next generation never got the shock, and they're afraid of the smell. And the next generation never got the shock, and they're afraid of the smell, too. Two generations away. So all of this is related to that, um, the fact that Joshua, that God had Joshua gather the people at Shechem because there was a rich tradition there, not only for this is where the promise happened, but also... This is where we got rid of idolatry 400 years ago, and this is where we're going to do it now. Okay? And those traditions, as we saw in the New Testament from 2 Thessalonians 2, those traditions are the same. Your kids are going to live by, or, I mean, your relatives, your friends, your, your, circle, of, your circle of influence. They're going to look at you. What traditions do you pass down? How do you deal with this? Because... You know, I mean, I like studying Greek and Hebrew, and, all, and I like reading the Bible, and I really am into that stuff, but there's like one in a million people that do that. Not many people read the Bible to that degree. Not many people even read the Bible regularly, even Christians. And if you don't think so, you ask them. And I'm not blaming anybody. Don't misunderstand me. I could get better at it myself. But the point is, they're going to read us they're going to read our behavior before they read the book. Okay, let's stand up and take a couple of minutes. Um, really, stand up and walk around, greet somebody, say hello. We'll open the door so it's not so hot in here. Anybody need some water, go get it. We'll take a couple of minutes here. It might be a, it might be a little long. It might be a little long. <laughs> I'll, I'll apologize. <laughs> so how are you doing, kid? Good. You doing all right? Yeah. School going well? Yeah. Good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. There? Yes, you do. 
You surely do. Hey, sir, how are you? Good to see you, Derek. Derek is you. a former student. Oh, really? Cool. That's fabulous. It's a small world, huh? Yeah. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. You walked up to me one night after class. He goes, you remember me? I recognize the very, face. Very good. I'm horrible with um, Very good, very good. Outstanding, outstanding. <clears throat> hey, sir, how are you? You doing all right? Good, 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 good. good. Epigenetics is cool. You got to look into it. It's really cool. It's cool from a positive and, and negative perspective. I mean, the negative is really negative. But it's really cool that God built this mechanism in the human behavior that makes choice critical. It's not optional. It's not the nature or nurture thing. This is the answer to it. It's, nur it's nurture, and ultimately, it's nurture, right? provided there's not pathology. It's nurture because of that. Yeah, that whole thing about the curse being passed on generations makes a lot more sense. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. No question. <laughs> we'll get started when y'all are ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, for sure. So the, the life lesson um, that I got from this, I mean, obviously, when we read the chapter initially, I was serious about the fact that when you read the Bible, when things occur to you, I, I would encourage you to trust that that is God working in you. You should pay attention to those things. Holy Spirit is in you. Holy Spirit is not dormant. It acts. It brings things to your attention. Jesus Christ talks about it in the last things he told the disciples before he went to be crucified. You know, So he'll bring things to your remembrance. So when you read God's word, things that you notice, I would encourage you to take note of those. Maybe look at them further. Maybe they'll come up in your day. Maybe they'll come up with a loved one, family member, friend, etc., etc., etc. So... Um, anyway, Christian spiritual training of a family has multi-generational effects. The fact that <clears throat> my mom and dad uh, took me to a Lutheran church, at least to the point that I believed that Jesus was my Lord and Savior, even though I was not a practicing Christian at that point, you know, at the, at the point of high school, that had an effect on my life, um, a transgenerational effect. Okay? But the bad stuff does too. Now, when we make poor choices, that's going to, believe it or not, that can be passed on. We see it in Joshua. Remember, Jacob, his, the idolatry thing, was about 400 years, some odd years, 400 years before the record we read in Joshua 24. Joshua 24, as I mentioned, is dealing with the same thing. So for four centuries, what kind of choices do you think these guys are making? And they're just passing on their error. Passing on their air. Just keep it going. Keep it rolling. Just keep doing it. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to mention, this is a little bit, I mean, I, I tend to think, when I first read Joshua 24, I tended to think that Joshua actually called all of the people to Shechem. The way some translations translate this, that is the case. I noticed when Jeff read his, it says he gathered the leaders and the people. Other translations, the King James, to some degree, indicates more that it was the leaders that he called and that when you read about the people, it's the leaders who were standing in the stead of the people. That is to say, they were the representatives of the people. Now, I don't know for sure which one is absolutely accurate. I can't tell you for sure, but either way, the leaders were there, and that was a very important part because... Um, as we've talked about with men being either leaders of themselves, of their f marriages, of the families in the church, leadership is extremely important. It was extremely important also to Paul, what we talk about, we saw it in Joshua 24. Uh, I'll, I'll cite these couple of examples from Titus and Timothy. I don't, again, the chronology of the New Testament, which I, th I think it's important that you understand it. Um, first and second Timothy and Titus were actually written during a time that's not recorded in the New Testament. That is to say, they were written after the end of the book of Acts. After the end of the book of Acts, Paul was imprisoned at the end of the book of Acts. 
He's then out of prison for a while, that's not recorded, and he's then re-imprisoned and he's martyred, right? About, I don't know, three, four years later, something like that, under Nero, the Roman emperor at that time. During that period that is not recorded, he took another missionary journey. He did it again, right? He, he, we saw three and then his trip to Rome. So well, he takes another missionary journey in that time frame. During that time, he goes to Crete, according to Titus. He goes to Ephesus, according to 1 Timothy. He writes 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. He writes those epistles. That all happens in that time before he's actually imprisoned for the last time and martyred. So when he's in Crete, he says to Titus, For the, this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. All right? And then I just want to mention 1 Timothy 3 actually deals with most of a chapter, well, a, a number of verses on what a leader should look like. And I, we're not going to look at this, but I encourage you to look at it because the characteristics are um, very telling of, of what a leader should look like. You know, so I encourage you to look at that. But the point is, it, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he talks about the fact that he left Timothy in Ephesus. And traditionally, that was where Timothy actually died, was beaten to death for the faith in Ephesus. He was the overseer in Ephesus. But Paul leaves him in Ephesus before he's finally killed, martyred. Um, but the, the, what an overseer was supposed to look like and their role and how early on they had to be there was critically important to God and, their, and to Paul. The people had to have leaders because, generally speaking, as the leaders go, so go the people. Most people, myself included, at least in some respects, if not most respects, are not leaders. They're followers, for the most part. I mean, we're called to be leaders in certain situations, like, again, marriage, family, church, you know, that sort of thing. But otherwise, many times, people are not leaders, they're followers. So how, how the leadership goes, frequently, is how the people are going to go. So Joshua made sure the leadership was here, because this was going to be a hard lesson that was centuries in the making, Put away the strange gods, right? You've been dealing with this. Abraham dealt with it when he was an Ur of the Chaldees, and I called him out of it. And then Joshua gets rid of it at Shechem. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. Four centuries on, we're going to get rid of the idols. You leaders, you make sure it happens. He made sure they were there. Very, it's critically important. And important for us because we're in positions of leadership. Again, whether it's yourself, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your family, whether it's the church, whether it's your job and your business or all the above, you're in a position of leadership. Right. Um, and that's the, the fathers provoked not your children's wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. You know, really child rearing, this is just my perspective. Child rearing is really like training camp, except this training camp is roughly 20 years long. That's really what it is. It's a training camp, but it's 20 years long. You're never not their father. But the first 20 years are the most important. Okay. So nurture and admonition, it, it doesn't ever stop. Discipleship, that's a training camp. It doesn't happen, no disrespect meant to SOD or anything else. It doesn't happen in a class. It's not going to happen with you sitting in that row memorizing a scripture. That ain't going to happen. I'm not saying it doesn't help, but that's not going to happen. Discipleship is a mentor-mentee relationship. That's really what it is. Okay. So. Um, by the way, we can leave that open. I don't care. If you're hot, just leave it open. Oh, okay, it doesn't matter to me. I just, if you're not comfortable, we'll open the door. So generally speaking, as the leadership goes, so goes the people. Um, we talked about serving God. You mentioned about serving God. You know, he says, he recounts God's faithfulness. God did this, God did that, God did that, God did this, and then he says, now therefore. You mentioned that when you noticed the chapter. So. I thought the same thing. Serving God is the logical thing to do. We see it in Joshua 23, 13, and 14. Right? I have given you a land for which you did not labor, cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, of vineyards and olive vineyards which you planted not, do you eat? Now therefore, you know, I did all this for heaven's sake. The logical thing for you to do is serve, is obey. Right? Of course. I, of course it is. We see the very same thing I mentioned then. We see the very same thing in Romans. In Romans, the book of Romans, in chapters 1 through 8, Paul doctrinally, God by way of Paul's revelation, doctrinally outlines exactly what Christ did for us. We were dead in trespasses and sins. 
We're justified as if we've never sinned. We can never be separated from the love of God in chapter 8. And then 9 and 10 and 11 are kind of parenthetical with Israel, what their position is. But then he gets to 12 and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's the therefore referred to? Chapters 1 through 8. Everything I did for you in Christ. The logical thing for you to do is, and that's interesting, interestingly what the word reasonable is, it's the Greek word logikos. It's the Greek word logikos. The logical thing for you to do is to serve, is to obey, is to be transformed because of everything I did for you. Just like in Joshua, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Now, therefore, choose me. You know, obey, for heaven's sake. <clears throat> uh, the other scripture I thought of with this is that's just a great scripture. I, th I think I emphasized this to my kids when they were little, I believe, so that they truly under they didn't get to adolescence and have what we, what did we, we used to call that something. Oh, shoot. It was sort of an I'm the center of the universe attack. Really, I, that's what we, we used to call it, something like that. When you're adolescents, all of a sudden, you're I'm the center of the universe, right? They have an I'm the center of the universe attack. So I would, we would read this verse together. Paul's talking to the Corinthians, right? He says, for who makes you to differ from another? What do you have that you didn't receive? Now, if you received it, why do you glory as if you hadn't? Everything you got was given to you for heaven's sake. Why do you think you should gloat over the fact that you got it? It's great scripture. Great for adolescents. <laughs> it's really great. Not bad for people in general, but it's great for adolescents. <laughs> so anyway, the other thing I thought of, and you may remember this from, um, I talked about this in one of the chapters I taught earlier. We talked about God's goodness and the logical response. Right? The logical response is obey. So let's compare that God's goodness and everything I did for you and therefore obey to the alternative, which they chose. They chose the alternative, right? They chose, and we can, we'll look at this more next week, not this week. They chose, we'll see um, more in Judges chapters 1, 2, and 3, which is sort of the, it, it repeats some things in Joshua, but then it's sort of the sequel of how things really went going forward after Joshua dies. So they chose instead the alternative, which was the Canaanite religion, which we'll see in Joshua 24, 15. He says, you know, he says in 13, 14, he says, now therefore obey, okay? Fear God. But if you choose not to fear God, then pick the idol you want to worship, whether you want to worship the ones you used to worship over in Mesopotamia or you want to you worship the ones over here. Pick the one. So they picked the ones in Canaan. If you, I, we, you may remember Psalm 106, where it says that the Israelites gave their children for sacrifice. You can read it sometime. It's like 34 and following. They gave their children to die to the idols. Right? So they got to the point of full assimilation. They partook completely in that religion, even to the point that they would kill their children. So, the Canaanite religion was characterized by divination, fortune-telling, witchcraft. We'll look at that next week. There's a great example of that whose effect is 500 years later with Saul for one of the, and because of one particular city that it says, and I think it's Joshua 15, that they didn't eradicate the Canaanites. There's a consequence 500 years later with Saul because of that. We'll look at it next week. Witchcraft, female and male temple prostitutes, this was all characteristic of their religion. Adultery, homosexuality, transvestitism, pederasty, that's men with boys, you know. Uh, bestiality, that's people with beasts, people with animals, okay. This was all characteristic. Um, incest, also child sacrifice, you may remember, I didn't, um, archaeological evidence indicates that they did this not to, this was not isolated. They did this to thousands of kids, up to as old as four years old. And they can, of course, tell that by the remains, you know, what the skeletal remains. They can tell how old he or she was, whether it was he or she, and how many there were. They can tell all that stuff. So child sacrifice. Infants to children as old as four years, the method of sacrifice was burning. I mentioned, you know, they, they had an idol. They'd have a fire. The big hands of the idol were like this. They'd have a fire under the hands. The hands were made of metal. They'd put the child in the hands, and they'd light the fire. And that's how they sacrificed the child. 
um, some, sometimes numbered in the thousands. Okay, so um, anyway, the logical thing for them to do with everything God did was choose to obey. What they chose was not logical. It was all the things we just read about. <coughs> they chose that. They chose to do that instead of worship God. Now, you've got to really think about that and just kind of wrap your mind around that and recognize that. This was multi-generations now. Back as far as Jacob, he was dealing with idols and had to cleanse them. In Canaan, back as far as Sodom and Gomorrah, in Genesis 19, the best thing God knew to do with Sodom and Gomorrah was destroy them because of how bad they were. Okay? That was the same land 500 years before the Promised Land, before Joshua takes them in. And he says, as you remember, we read in Deuteronomy 7, I think, he says, you kill them all. Everything that breathes, you kill it. They didn't do that. We'll look at that next week. We won't look at that today. They didn't do that. They chose not to do that. Huge consequences. Huge consequences. Not only that generation, not only the generation that were raised in the wilderness saw God's miracles, were miraculously sustained by manna every day for 40 years until Joshua chapter 5 and they actually got into the promised land, but they chose idolatry. Pretty wild. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, so we're going to talk briefly about the power to choose, and then we'll end because I don't want to keep it too long. Um, in Joshua 24, 15, we'll just read, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I have to confess that what I have read this verse, I don't know, 500 times, probably. Memorized Joshua 24, 15, B. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Memorize that. Seen it on a million plaques. But when I think about this, when I thought about this verse, and this is not a deep truth, it's just an instance when I didn't really look. You know, I look at the verse and I thought, he's presenting them the, the choice between God and idols. Right? But he's not. He says, in, he says in the verse before that, now therefore, you know, worship God. For everything he did, worship God. In this verse he says, but if you decide that's evil, then here's your choice. You either choose the old idols or the new idols. That's the choice. Right? If you think it's evil to do that, then your choice is either worship the old idols or the new ones. That's what Joshua 24, 15 is about. Right? But the, the, the biggest word, the hugest word in this, and it's nothing special like the Hebrew word. It doesn't mean anything special. It's, not, it's like Pastor David used to say, you know, you know what the Greek word for and is? And. You know, it's, it's nothing special. It means choose. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing like this word means. It means choose. It means you either do this or you do that. So let's um, ask, uh, I want to ask a question about your just recollection of like Genesis 1 and 2. Okay, so what's the first thing God says, just think about it, and then you can, when you have an answer, just, you know, say it. What's the first thing God says to man? First thing that God, that is recorded that God says to man. Uh, Actually, in light of that, it might be the, technically the second. Might technically be the second if you count that the first. It's in Genesis two. Mm -hmm. It's in Genesis two. And this is not a test. I just want. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be more likely to remember this if you think of it, not if I just tell you. I mean, that's the bottom line here, really. First thing God says to man, and you can look at your Bibles if you want to. I don't care. This is not. A, I mean, you can look at your Bibles for heaven's sake. So, look at they're like, I don't really like that. I didn't think I didn't figure out a quiz tonight. What's that? <laughs> and then this is probably the last thing we'll cover because I don't want to keep you too late here. Yes. First, first thing God says to man, and you can all look it up too. First thing God says to man, 
is, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat of it. In the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. First thing God says, after the command of be fruitful and multiply, if you want to count that as, you know. So, the point being, what is, based on that, what is fundamental to human life? What is fundamental to obedience to God? Choosing what God says to do. It's the very first thing that he tells man. Do this, don't do that. If you do that, that's the consequence. The very first thing. So our power to choose, I mean, arguably, it's maybe the most... Well, certainly next to Jesus Christ's sacrifice as God's son. It's the most loving thing God ever did to create us with freedom of will, to allow us to choose to love him versus be forced or be robotic. The greatest thing he ever did was give us freedom of will, which is why when we read Romans 12, Paul says there, I beseech you. Beseech means beg. It means actually get on your knees. Okay? And that's the best that God, as the creator of the heavens and the earth, spoke everything into being in six days. That's the best he can do to get you to obey. You can't force that. He has to beg you. He has to beg you to obey. He has to try to induce you to obey by recounting all the good things he's done. I've done this and this and this and this and this. Now, therefore, choose. Beseech. I beg you, please. But he can't force you. He gave you the power to choose. I think that's, yeah, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. So, uh, a couple things about choices, and then we'll... So, we're going to talk briefly about choices because that's a central theme in the book of Joshua. A couple things about choices which we won't probably develop. Um, good choices beget good choices. We saw that with the epigenetics idea. If you make good choices, not only in your life is it easier to make good choices, but it's also easier for your kids. If you make good choices, it's going to be easier for them. Believe it or not, I don't care if you believe it or not, it's true. So I'm just telling you, do it. <laughs> not that you don't. I'm not saying, I'm not, not saying you don't. Okay, good choices are as easy to make as bad choices. You know, they're easy to make. Now, we habitually don't do it. I'm not saying it's not, I'm not saying that there is not, that it is not a task to make good choices. But even the Apostle Paul in Romans 7 says, you know, the good that I would do, that's what I don't do. But, the, you know, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There is a sin nature. There is a heavenly nature. There is a godly nature. There is a battle between them. It is your choice which one you feed. The one you feed is the one that's going to win. Okay? But it's as easy to feed the good as it is to feed the bad. Not that we're always successful, but it's as easy to do. Um, not choosing is choosing. Not making a choice is making a choice. So don't ever think, you know, I'm not going to decide. You just decided by not deciding. And then uh, this is the last thing we'll cover. Your frame of reference greatly influences your choices. Here's what I mean by that. And we'll probably only touch on this and maybe start next week with this because this, has, this leads into the other things in the book of Joshua. Um, Again, Margaret and I were talking as we were traveling, driving to Florida. So we were talking about choices. I was telling her what I was going to share generally from Joshua 24, and she adds in her, you know, she's, well, this is an example. Mike, you can do this, this slant. You know, there's a, here's another point, we, and we'll talk like that. <clears throat> so she said she was the one that just met. I talked about the importance of choice. She said one of the things we cover with the people who are addicted to opioids, you know, or to, to drugs, is that your frame of reference really you, sort of pre-chooses your choices. Here is what I mean. Here's the example she used. So an addict, an addict, a person addicted to drugs, comes in and says, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit taking drugs. And uh, she says, OK. She says, here's what I want you to do. She says, I, I don't believe you. Here's what I want you to do. And when you do this, then I'll believe you. She says, get a new phone with none of your old contacts in it. Get a new place to live where you're not near all of the friends that were giving you the drugs. Go a different way home so that you don't meet any of those people. And you make all those changes. And then I'll believe you that you're not going to take drugs. So what had to happen by making those changes is 
the frame of reference changes. Okay? By, by following all the old habit patterns, he's pre-choosing. He's predisposing himself to making poor choices. Unless you change the underlying frame of reference. And here's a good uh, biblical example. Um, Romans chapter 3. We'll just read this and then I think we'll close. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. This is so... Uh, Romans chapter 3 is so instructive of human nature. And it uh, starts in 3.10, which is one of the, you know, there is none righteous, no, not one. Isn't that right, Tom? S-O-D? Isn't that right? 3.10? Very good. Had to get some brownie points there. Just kidding. <laughs> 3.10, so uh, this is a quotation from Psalm. Uh, anyway, at 3.10 it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that do, doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. Last verse, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, the only reason I say that is, the last verse is a statement of their frame of reference. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Therefore, all the other stuff that's described, all those behaviors, arose out of that frame of reference. They didn't fear God. There is no God as far as they were concerned. So it didn't make any difference what they did. Right? That was their frame of reference. Their choices were predicated on their frame of reference. If there's no God, just like with... <laughs> well, anyway, if there's no God, you're going to make different choices. If there is a God, you've got that frame of reference, and you're going to choose based on that. You're not going to... There's a consequence for what you do if there's a God. If there's not a God, there's no consequence. What difference does it make? So the power to choose is greatly influenced by your frame of reference. Where are you coming from? Okay, are you going to take the same old way home? Keep the same context so so-and-so can text you, I've got some stuff? Are you going to do all that stuff? Are you going to do that? Or are you actually going to change your frame of reference so that you're more likely to make good choices? <coughs> um, and I think... We'll close there because it's 10 after 8. So, um, and then if you've got questions or comments, we can do that. We'll pick it up next week. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to study your word. Um, so appreciate its accuracy, its integrity, um, how plainly it speaks into our lives, um, the high calling to which it calls us. Help us to rise to that calling, Heavenly Father, as um, men, as leaders in whatever capacity uh, we may be. Um, we ask you help us to rise to the level of your word, to the level that you call us. And again, thank you for these men, for their taking the time to be here. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.